test.
this off just yeah. because it seems that people are I think this, this, this is the right moment to welcome you all at the beginning of, uh, again, a PBL Academy lecture. Um, this is also the moment in history where we have a small break with the tradition. 
uh, because we, we uh, up to now the PBL Academy lecture was in the Royal Academy or the Royal Theatre in The Hague, and now we for the first time have moved the PBL. We have an additional. Is it working now again? Yeah? There's some mysterious atmospheric space somewhere. Okay. Um, so, welcome at the PBL.
Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, 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 a real, it's a real pleasure to be here at PBL, uh, to be here in The Hague, uh, not just because I left Washington to come here, uh, but because this is just a tremendous uh, opportunity to speak to all of you about a topic that I think is, 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 is truly a fundamental question for all of us today. Um, I want to thank Hans, uh, not only for the invitation, but for that terrific uh, setup uh, for what I plan to share with, uh, with you. But before I jump into that, I just wanted to get a, a show of hands. How many of you have heard about the World Resources Institute before today? Okay, well, that's <laughs> reassuring. <laughs> so Yannick and Alberto have been doing a fantastic job. And as Hans, as Hans mentioned, um, you know, we work on six big issues. We work on... We work on climate, we work on energy, food, forests, water, and cities. Our approach is that we, we count it. Um, you know, we do strong emphasis on data and um, you know, analysis, high quality analytical work. Uh, we change it, we focus on policy reforms, building institutions, shifting public and private investment flows. And, and we scale it. And clearly, the change it and scale it, we must do with others. Uh, and that's why uh, partnerships with PBL, uh, with other organizations in the Netherlands, is, is, is so central. Um, I, I also wanted to just kind of um, set, set my talk up with, with a, little, a little short story. About four years ago, uh, President Obama made a very big announcement uh, speech at Georgetown University uh, in June of 2013, where he laid out his uh, vision, his plan for the United States to tackle climate change. Uh, it included uh, a four-point plan, but you know, at the heart of it was about decarbonizing the power sector, the transport sector. A lot of what he put in place over the subsequent years was laid out in that speech four years ago at Georgetown. Within 24 hours of him giving that speech, some of you may recall that the Heritage Foundation came out with a very critical piece of analysis suggesting that if people, if the United States followed uh, Obama's climate action plan, uh, it would have significant negative costs on GDP, on jobs, on electricity prices. And, and within 24 hours, and, and that is just kind of epitomized the state of debate that we continue to have today uh, in the United States about whether or not uh, climate action makes good economic sense. And what we're seeing today from Trump and his, you know, and his colleagues in the administration is serious concerns about whether or not uh, that is the case. So the topic we're talking about today has, has huge, huge relevance. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you a little bit about kind of WRI's kind of intellectual journey. It's not a very linear journey, um, but it'll just shape a little bit about our, our exploration about these issues related uh, to economic uh, growth and climate action, sustainable development action. So it's going to draw upon two, two, um, two resources. One is something called the Global Commission on Economy and Climate, which is a commission that we helped set up with other research institutes about uh, three and a half years ago. It uh, was chaired by former uh, president of Mexico, Calderon, President Felipe Calderon, and was co-chaired by Nick Stern. Uh, today, it just sh recently it just shifted. We now have Paul Pullman and Ngozi Okunja Uyala as the co-chairs. And, uh, and as well as Nick Stern and Calderon has stepped down, he's still on the commission. But this basic commission really spent the last few years trying to provide the, the, the most comprehensive, exhaustive treatment of econo the economics of climate action. So that's one, one body of literature that I'm going to draw from for this deck. And the second is kind of our own work at WRI kind of research that we have been doing over the years on many of these different themes. This is just a sample of some of those publications that I'll look at. And the central, the central exam question, really, is, you know, is it possible to achieve inclusive, lasting economic growth while taking action on climate? Um, another way to look at it uh, slightly is, is you know, we're, we're living today in a world 
that I would argue still uh, is in search of a good growth story, a good growth model. Uh, uh, and we also recognize that despite many of the efforts, environmental performance is not where we need it to be. Uh, and then you have a, uh, a group, a, a school of thought that says that if you have low growth or if you, if you take you know, significant action on the climate, you undercut growth, the limits to growth argument. There are others that would argue if you take action on, the in, uh, on growth, you're not able to kind of address the environment. The point we want to try to make is that you can actually do both and that it is in the economic self-interest of countries to do both. And so the conceptual framework that the new climate economy work uh, came up with about three years ago that we have been using quite a bit in our own thinking is, is captured in this short diagram. And what we try to say here is that there are three key economic systems that must be transformed if we're going to solve the climate problem. About 80 to 90 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions are captured either in cities kind of in urban areas, in land use, looking at forests, looking at agriculture and the intersection between the two, and looking at energy. But the argument we're trying to make would be that when one looks at the growth equation, what would one do to stimulate growth? We look at resource productivity or efficiency as kind of one way in which to stimulate growth. You could look at making investments in infrastructure, and you could look at innovation. And the argument that we're making is that those levers to address growth in these three key economic systems are precisely what one would want to do if one wanted to shift from a high carbon, low efficient trajectory to a low carbon, high efficient trajectory. So that's kind of the captures kind of the essence of the argument. And what I'm going to try to do is to narrate or illustrate this with some examples uh, looking at cities, uh, looking at land use, looking at energy. I'm going to talk briefly about some of the recent work that we've uh, released around finance. And then I thought I would um, end with a little bit of an update on what the hell's happening in the United States on these issues. <laughs> so um, with that, let me, uh, let me, let's jump into the cities, into the cities, uh, you know, conversation. You all know the statistics. Um, you know, cities home to more than half of the world's population, 80% of global economic growth, 70-75% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions. We know that urbanization is going to uh, continue to explode another 2.5 billion people in cities by the year 2050. But we also know that cities are developing an incredibly uh, unstructured uh, unstructured, unplanned ways, and that this is creating huge externalities. This is a graph just to look at uh, air pollution. Uh, this is PM10 uh, measurements for the 50 largest cities. And you could see basically that almost no of the, none of the major 50 cities meets, uh, meets the WHO threshold here, but you see a particularly uh, problematic uh, set of uh, pollution both in the Middle East, North Africa, but particularly in Asia. We know that outdoor air pollution results in 3 million deaths per year. 90% uh, of these deaths take place in low or middle income countries. And if you actually try to assess the economic costs of premature deaths associated with PM 2.5 or PM 10, this amounts oftentimes to 4, 8, 10% of GDP, kind of the value of the damages in many, many countries. So this is a significant cost. Um, taking another look at congestion, just looking at the opportunity cost to time, uh, looking at the damages associated um, with congestion is also significant economic costs associated with that. Uh, there was, uh, in 2010, some of you may recall that story, there was a traffic jam in Beijing that lasted nine days. 90 kilometers, nine days. Uh, could you imagine being stuck uh, in that? Um, in another study that we did, part of the new climate economy, we didn't look just at traffic congestion, but we looked at sprawl, and we looked at both public and private costs associated with sprawl. So vehicle costs, the costs associated with uh, 
uh, infrastructure for uh, delivering public services, but also kind of air pollution, health-related costs in the United States. One trillion dollars per year for sprawl. So these, these are significant numbers associated with these types of costs, strong environmental externalities. And it's not just the environment, right? We're living at a point in time where cities are, particularly in the developing world, expanding in a very significant way, but there's a huge issue of inclusivity, right? The underserved 70% of city re residents lack access to one or more basic core services that cities should be able to develop. And so you have here this tension that cities need to meet the immediate growing need of the underserved, of their own residents, while at the same time, the need to make longer term decisions that shape the built environment. And that's, that's, that's the crux, uh, the challenge we have in cities. Um, so, so what do we do about it, right? One of the things that we had uh, found was just how important uh, compact cities can be for uh, developing cities that are uh, better places to live, more environmentally friendly, but also quite prosperous, high quality of life. How many of you have been to Atlanta? Has anyone here been to Atlanta? Um, any of you been to also Barcelona? If you've been to both, I suspect, and I asked you where you would prefer to live, <laughs> Exactly, right? So you have two cities that share a similar kind of economic wealth, GDP per capita, um, similar population. Uh, Barcelona is a fifth the size of Atlanta with a carbon footprint that is comparably uh, a similar fraction, right? So similar economics, vastly different, uh, vastly different carbon footprints, much better quality of life. Uh, another quick example, uh, Houston, Copenhagen, uh, just to give you know, a similar type of challenge here, uh, but just a different measurement. Uh, looking 14% of local GDP is spent on transportation. In Houston, only 4% of GDP is spent in Copenhagen. So one issue, compact. Um, another is kind of connected, looking at public transit. Here you see that um, a range of kind of smart transport systems have exploded uh, since the year 2000. You take something like car-free zones, right? Introduced in Rotterdam in 1953. Right now, 360 cities. Uh, Bike-sharing schemes have exploded. There are now 850 cities with bike-sharing sch schemes. Uh, bus rapid transit, kind of, you know, this kind of modern urban transport systems, dedicated lanes and so forth, uh, custom designed bus stations, Curitiba, 1970s, first one, now we have close to 200 cities. So you're seeing smart transport systems uh, really take, uh, take charge, kind of take, take, go forward. Um, this kind of analysis actually tried to do a fairly meta level assessment of if you look at these low carbon city solutions, do they make good economic sense? And we know that there's lots of limitations in these types of uh, analyses. But what we've done here is we've kind of looked at energy prices and discount rate. We looked at buildings. We looked at transport. We looked at waste. And we looked at just what is the NPV of investments for smart, low-carbon city solutions in those three sectors um, under a variety of scenarios. And what we came up with was quite remarkable, $17 trillion dollars of economic value between 2006 and 2050 by making investments in these three sectors in cities. So again, that there's strong economic incentives as to why one would do that, but clearly a number of barriers that prevent the type of scaling that we would like to see. We are seeing, that said, quite a bit of movement. Uh, many of you may have heard of the Global Covenant uh, of Mayors. Uh, this combined the Compact of Mayors and the European Covenant of Mayors. Cities make uh, commitments, as you know, to measure their emissions, to set a target, to develop an action plan to reduce their emissions. We now have 7,000 cities that have joined this. There's seven, I think 16 cities in the Netherlands are part of this. Not yet The Hague, I don't think, but, uh, but still an incredible kind of crescendo of momentum. Uh, we're, seeing in, um, we're seeing in China. I was in China last week. Uh, incredible, incredible story. Many of you know that China uh, made its climate commitment was to peak uh, emissions on or around 2030. 
Uh, who here thinks China will beat their target? The story now is it's quite plausible China already peaked their carbon emissions. It's incredible what's taking place in China today. This is, uh, this is where they wanted to show a vanguard of action was this pilot around low carbon cities where they now have 80, 90 cities that have committed to peaking prior to 2030, many of them peaking in 2020. But just the, the new normal in China, uh, different growth, different uh, structure of kind of economic growth that we're seeing taking place today has led to this remarkable, remarkable pace of change in China. Um, another China example, they've also made a commitment, uh, 36 or so pilot cities to scale to 660 cities where they're going to want to see that the share of public transit reaches 60%. So if you look here, Paris, kind of Seoul, have a 60% share of public transit as, a, as kind of the modal share of, tra of urban transportation. China wants all their cities to achieve this within the next 10 to 15 years. So massive, massive changes taking place. So we're beginning to see some of that. So just a couple of very quick recommendations on cities. Um, you know, big focus around how we connect, compact, coordinated. And a big thing also, that one of the big challenges why we're not seeing this is on financing. The challenge cities have for financing these types of urban investments. How they generate their own revenues, how they become credit worthy so they can borrow from commercial markets. Big challenges as to why. So just a, a little bit of a snapshot on cities. Let me turn to land use now and say um, a few words around land use. You know the, you know the challenge, we need to produce 70% more calories by 2050 to feed the planet. The real simple question is how do we do so without trashing it kind of in the process. Um, so land use uh, is about 20 to 25% of direct, you know, if one looks at both direct and indirect impacts, 20 to 25 percent of global CO2 emissions, but they represent actually a slightly larger share of near-term mitigation opportunities from an economic standpoint, because many of those reductions actually make strong economic sense because of the services that forests, that land provide more broadly to society. So the way we've been looking at this is that there needs to be a focus on how to actually boost yields and limit the expansion to existing degraded lands, not to encroach on natural forests. Um, how we reduce growth and consumption of food, and I'm going to come back to that in a moment, while at the same time restoring forests, restoring degraded lands, uh, avoiding deforestation, and doing so all in a spirit of improving livelihoods. So the approach that we've been taking to our land use work is about how does one produce, protect, and prosper. Looking a little bit about uh, tree cover loss, this is just uh, some recent data around global annual tree cover loss remains high despite all the efforts. We're still losing you know, about, uh, about 20 uh, million uh, hectares of, of, of tree cover uh, each year. Uh, much of that, uh, next slide. Oh, that's okay. Much of that much of that has been focused, much of the focus has been around Brazil and Indonesia. Uh, we've seen significant improvement in Brazil, though the last two, three years things have gotten a little bit more challenging. Indonesia continues to be a challenge despite you know, ostensible government commitment. But the big thing here to keep an eye out for is significant tree cover loss happening outside of those two different areas. So one of the more encouraging kind of initiatives that we've been part of, that we've, we, we feel, is that a focus not just only on what governments can do, but public-private partnerships. So there's this uh, partnership called the Tropical Forest Alliance that brings together governments, the private sector, and civil society. And basically, companies are making commitments around deforestation-free supply chains, looking at palm oil, looking at coca, looking at uh, soy, looking at beef, uh, biggest kind of uh, progress has been made on palm oil. But again, just these deforestation-free supply chain commitments, so looking at the market to drive real change around the incentives for protecting forests. Turning to the restoration story, this is actually another story that demonstrates really good economics, only if we can get kind of the institutions and the governance kind of in place. This is a great example from Niger, where you had very, very semi-arid arid land and you had 
a big investment around farmer-assisted natural regeneration. So regenerating their agricultural kind of land through some type of selective regrowth of, of, of plants, uh, trees, shrubs on farm, and also some selective planting in between kind of different crops. And what you saw was this pretty remarkable improvement in productivity of the land uh, that led to a doubling of farm income of over a million households and a significant sequestration of carbon as a result of the more vibrant kind of vegetation on that land. Again, another example of something that is good for livelihoods, is good for, um, and is good for the environment. Uh, this restoration kind of kind of story has been bolstered by some global commitments that have been made recently. We have the bond challenge, which was made uh, about several years ago for 150 million hectares of reforestation by 2020. Uh, at the climate summit in 2014 uh, in New York City, there was a big New York declaration on forests where an, another commitment was made for 350 million hectares by 2030. So we're beginning to see this movement around protecting and restoring kind of forests. Uh, and this is some work that we've been doing with NAPAD and IUCN to help generate those types of commitments. It's called AFR 100. It's really about mobilizing countries in Africa to make commitments to restore degraded agricultural and forest lands. And we've been quite, uh, quite impressed and surprised by how quickly the uptake in making these commitments to restore lands has been. We all know at the end of the day, however, that making commitments is relatively easy. Making sure that they're implemented in a high quality way, in ways that kind of protect livelihoods, improve livelihoods, will be the real challenge. And that's where the shift is happening at this point in time. One of the areas we're also kind of doing some work at WRI is we've been uh, spending a lot of time looking at how to monitor forest loss using satellite images, remote sensing. We're starting, the technology is advancing so quickly that we now are able to actually leverage remote sensing, cloud computing, uh, as well as kind of, kind of more bottom-up approaches to monitor restoration or regrowth. So we're actually able to see now when tree cover comes back and how high that tree cover is. You can actually measure because of the way in which the uh, algorithms have been uh, programmed to be able to measure the regrowth uh, of trees in that area. So kind of a very interesting development there. Turning to food, uh, this waterfall chart just shows you a little bit about agriculture-related greenhouse gas emissions in 2050 under business-as-usual situation on the left, where we need to be if we want to go to a two-degree world on the right, and the different ways in which we can reduce that or address that gap. Spoke a little bit about restoration, but I want to pick up on two other food issues that we have been working quite a bit on. One is food loss and waste, and the other is kind of shifting diets. So you all know um, food, huge problem. One third of food is lost or wasted each year. Massive economic implications for all this lost food, right? And significant greenhouse gas emissions. If you took all the cattle in the world and put them and made them a single nation, they would be the third largest emitter in the world after China and the United States. So massive, massive climate opportunity here. This gives you a little bit of a chart in terms of where food is lost or waste, wasted by region. And what you see, perhaps not surprisingly, is in the developed world, most of the food is wasted. It's, it's by the fork. It's at the consumer side, right? And in the developing world, most of the food is actually wasted near the farm, right? It's, it's storage, it's poor transportation, it's losing the food on the way to the market. But the economics of addressing food loss and waste are, as you would imagine, remarkable. The only uh, country that I think we have really good economic data on interventions to deal with food loss and waste is in the UK. But you see this remarkable returns, which, which isn't surprising when you think about the economics of reducing um, waste. Uh, this was a five-year period, quite remarkable. It was the UK government, RAP, a number of other UK NGOs that focused on this but a 21% reduction in household food waste over five years. Significant commitment from CEOs of major UK retailers for this, significant support, policy environment from government, and some, phenomenally, um, some phenomenal uh, work by some UK NGOs. 
we have been kind of looking at that experience and others and realizing here's another tipping point, the opportunity kind of to build a movement around how to actually take that example and examples in other countries to build a global movement around reducing food loss and waste. So we set up this commission that is uh, chaired by Dave Lewis, who is the CEO of Tesco, and actually uh, a Dutchman, uh, Hans, uh, where is his, can't pronounce his, Hogewin, Hoge, the former uh, DG here, the Minister, Minister of Agriculture, we've been working with, and sorry, I know I butchered his name, so, <laughs> but you know who he is. He's been um, phenomenally uh, active in helping support this coalition of champions that we're bringing together to take this and to kind of create the global awareness around food loss and waste. And the reason we call it Champions 12.3 is, as you may recall, on the SDGs, 12.3 is the target around food loss and waste. We've also been doing quite a bit of work around shifting diets. So as you can see here, I'm talking about the demand side of the food equation as opposed to the supply side. And this is kind of a, a, a scorecard that we developed uh, around the environmental impacts of a gram of protein for different types of plants and animals. And what you see is, you know, perhaps not surprising, you know, beef really stands out as having significant environmental impacts. Significant impacts about land, about water, as well as about greenhouse gas emissions. And the reason why beef is so, such an important kind of commodity to focus on is because the demand for beef is going to explode over the next 20, 30 years as the middle class, particularly in the developing world, jumps up and rises. The challenge, however, is um, if you look at what we actually need, we looked across different regions. What you see here is the average daily protein requirement that's needed is about 50 grams of protein. What's fascinating is in all regions around the world, on an average, of course, we exceed that. And the vast majority of that can be met with plant-based protein. So we have this issue where there's an overconsumption of calories and overconsumption of protein um, in many countries, in many regions around the world, and also a recognition that we not only want to reduce the overconsumption of calories where it may exist, we also want to try to shift from more meat-based to plant-based diets if we want to tackle some of the environmental externalities associated with that. And when we look at that, beef really stands out as the big, the big issue. One of the things we've been doing to look at how do we begin to create an awareness around the importance of shifting diets is we've pulled together a set of companies that are real experts around how to sell stuff to us that we shouldn't eat. Right, Fritos, Coca Cola, Coke, or you know, I mean, these 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 things that we love but we know is aren't good for us. And we're like, if we could deploy their brains, their minds to actually helping people shift to eat good stuff, imagine what we could do. So we pulled together, you know, Unilever, Sodexo, Hilton, Panera, Google. Google's always good to have in any partnership, um, you know, and set up this thing called the Better Buying Lab, right? Uh, that really is trying to test and research different strategies to encourage consumers to move towards healthier, more plant-based diets. Something quite as simple as when you have a menu and you call something is, you call it out as vegetarian, um, the number of non-vegetarians who eat that drop dramatically, right? I mean, these counterintuitive things, when you say food is healthy, those that aren't necessarily eating healthy won't choose that. Um, so how do you begin to tackle those types of little nudges to create the type of, the type of diet we want to see? So very quickly on land use, some basic uh, recommendations. They follow in no small part around the SDGs, but you know, um, so around forest loss, around restoration, around, around how we begin to address food loss and waste and shifting diets. Okay, third, uh, third story is around, um, yes, around energy. And I'm going to go to the next slide. I thought, how many of you have heard of the Energy Transitions Commission? Has anyone heard of that? Um, so this is, a, this is a body that was set up a couple years ago to explore uh, how we actually move towards a decarbonized energy system. It had a commission made up of kind of a number of people, including actually uh, co-chaired by the Shell, uh, by Shell, by Shell, uh, 
uh, CEO and, uh, and had a variety of other companies on it. And I thought this graph did a very nice job of trying to capture the energy challenge that we have. So on one axis, you have a recognition we need to improve energy productivity, right? And if we want to go to a two degree world, a well below two degree world, we need to see a per atom improvement in energy productivity by 3%. The other axis shows the share of zero carbon energy in the overall system. And we need to improve that by 1% per annum each year. So this is a pretty massive challenge. What you see is kind of where we are historically in the very bottom left. If you capture what is implied by all of the NDCs, the INDCs, for the next 15 years, you get a little closer. But still, the revolution, the transformation we need to see is that much greater. We need to see a 3% improvement per annum in the productivity of energy. We need to see a 1% share improvement in zero carbon energy in the overall global system. We also know um, that, that we already have fossil fuel reserves that far exceed the carbon budget, right? So on the left, you have proven reserves for coal, oil, and gas, both conventional and unconventional, which would equate to something between 3 to 5.4 trillion tons of CO2. And depending on, you know, if you're a betting person, whether you want to take a two-thirds chance of living within two degrees or a one-third chance, um, how much carbon we have left to emit um, you know, over the, next, over the next several decades. And you could see the disconnect there between the carbon budget we have and the carbon implied in the reserves already, already in, that have been found today. Um, we also know we have a huge energy access challenge. 1.2 billion people still don't have access. That number hasn't budged much. Percent as population has gone down, but the absolute numbers haven't budged that much. Um, particular kind of challenge in Africa Half of, the, half of those 1.2 billion people don't have electricity access are in Africa. Most of the others are in South Asia. So you have kind of a climate challenge, you have a access challenge, um, and you also have kind of a, a reliability of electricity to power growth challenge. How do you, how do you address all of that? On a more positive note, um, you know, the price of wind and solar continues to fall dramatically. I mean, these, these are quite, quite remarkable and they continue to decline. Right? But we know that these are intermittent energy sources, and one of the big things is how do you think about storage or other technologies that enable you to kind of reflect or mimic baseload generation. One of the things that the ETC study did is it actually showed within 10 or 15 years, we would have um, about uh, an all-in cost of renewables plus storage of around seven cents per kilowatt hour. When we get to that point, it can be com cost competitive globally in many places around the world. Uh, more than half of new electricity sector investment in 2016 was in renewables. So quite, quite impressive. We're already beginning to see investment in the power sector for renewables is starting to increase significantly. But when we look at what it will take to decarbonize the energy system, um, and this is perhaps the most significant from a climate standpoint, and perhaps one of the most challenging, we have to decarbonize the power sector first. We need to expand to the maximum extent possible as part of that electrification of those sectors that aren't connected to the power sector. So the obvious example, we need to electrify the transport sector. So that's kind of where we see significant opportunity um, in the next 25 years. There's going to be some things that cannot be easily electrified. We need to look at how to address that. We need to improve the pace of productivity improvements, energy efficiency, productivity improvements, highly capital intensive, but very, very strong economic returns. And we also need to figure out what we will do with unabated fossil fuel generation, right? So carbon capture and storage or some variant of that technology still will remain hugely relevant for some developing countries and for some industrial applications if we're going to get to a two degree world and some real challenges in developing that technology effectively. Positively, 80% of NDCs have a renewable energy target. Um, some, significant, some significant steps in terms of scale of what that means, whether it's in China, 20% of non-fossils is part of overall energy consumption, 
or India, 40% of installed capacity for power, some fairly big numbers. Um, Einstein once said, uh, in, 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 in aiming for the absurd, you can achieve the impossible. And I think to some extent, India's solar targets were quite, were quite, quite, uh, quite ambitious. They had three gigawatts of installed solar capacity when they made a commitment to get to 100 gigawatts within about eight or nine short years. Uh, and, and that has unleashed significant growth. They're not there yet, but they're starting to trend to come close to that target. So quite, quite impressive. And so the energy, you know, kind of the energy uh, kind of recommendations in no small part, how we shift away from coal as fast as possible, how we actually begin to really improve energy efficiency, and how we, um, and how we actually uh, create the adequate financing for this transition given the scale of investment that will be needed to support it. So with that, I want to turn a little bit to the financing question. Um, so the financing question uh, is, is, is really at the heart of all of these three stories. Financing is at the heart of what it will take to actually boost global demand growth. We need to think about how we move finance in that manner. Implementing the Sustainable Development Goals, as well as Paris and the Climate Agenda, at the heart of all three of these agendas lies infrastructure, sustainable infrastructure. And the type of infrastructure that we create, that we build over the next 15 years, um, is going to be more than the current stock of infrastructure we have today. So this question of what happens in the next 15 years in terms of what type of infrastructure that we finance is at the heart of whether or not all three of those agendas, the growth agenda, the sustainability agenda, the sustainable development agenda, and the climate agenda are met, right? Next 15 years more than the entire stock today, right? So 70% of that infrastructure is going to take place in the developing world, low income countries or emerging markets, and 60% of that is gonna take place in energy and transport. So it really kind of helps you focus in on where the real, the real challenge will be. Um, what we found is that the general view is that if you want to invest in low carbon infrastructure, it's gonna cost a lot more. Why banks, why financial institutions don't do this is because, hey, it's just too expensive. When we looked at this kind of over a wide range of different infrastructure choices, what we found is that it will cost a bit more, 5%, 10% more perhaps, because low carbon infrastructure investments are more capital intensive. But over the long run, those costs end up becoming a wash because if you have a solar plant, for example, the fuel costs associated with solar are, are negligible, whereas the coal costs are much more. So even though there's a higher upfront cost, when you look at it over the long term, it actually becomes a much more even comparable mix. So this report that um, is coming out or just came out a few months ago from the New Climate Economy, that global commission that I mentioned earlier, made the argument that there were four broad sets of recommendations we needed to focus on. We needed to tackle fundamental price distortions. Uh, there isn't a level playing field for low carbon versus high carbon. We needed to really invest in building the right policy frameworks and institutional capacities in countries with governments to help them develop the pipeline of bankable projects we needed to see. There's a lot of money out there, but the argument that people who have money, they're saying that they aren't projects to invest in. So how do we build and support governments in building the capacity to build that pipeline of projects? The financial system also needs to change. Uh, the financial system has rules and incentives that oftentimes support kind of conventional, centralized, large, high carbon infrastructure. How do we begin to think through that? And we also need to see huge, uh, huge investments in uh, innovation. So just to illustrate that very briefly, um, carbon pricing is exploding around the world. Pe most people don't recognize that. 40 countries now have carbon pricing schemes, 20 subnational entities. In China, they're gonna have a national ETS scheme uh, in place by the end of this year, early next year. When China's uh, ETS scheme comes on board, 
25% of global greenhouse gas emissions will be covered by some form of carbon pricing. Oftentimes the price is too low, but at least we're beginning to build a foundation for where we need to go. We're also seeing quite a bit of movement with financial institutions around greening those systems in terms of understanding the potential risk, climate risk associated with their investments. Um, already we have $25 trillion uh, assets under management that have joined this platform for climate actions that's kind of taking commitment steps to integrate climate risk into how they take decisions. The Bank of England is kind of leading the way. They're doing some really innovative work. China just recently announced uh, new guidelines for greening their financial system. That's actually pretty revolutionary for a developing country. And many of you may know that uh, Michael Bloomberg uh, chaired a task force for the G20 related to climate-related climate, uh, climate related disclosures. There, uh, so there is this movement, but I don't want to overstate it. Even the Bloomberg task force has met up with some resistance recently, and it's unclear whether or not the recommendations from that report will actually be endorsed at the G20 meeting in Hamburg in a few months. So that just is, uh, yeah, to that point. And, and, um, and on innovation, right, investment in innovation, this is quite a interesting little graph that shows uh, energy R&D as a percent of GDP and as a percent of total R&D in IEA countries. And what you see is just quite remarkable is the decline uh, in both those numbers over the past 30 years. So the public commitment to developing new energy technologies is, is quite low. And if we're serious about this energy transformation, if we're serious about financing a different type of infrastructure, we need to think about how to actually increase the R&D associated with that. So with that, let me, let me turn to the final kind of story, you know, the, the US and, and you know, what, what this guy is doing. Um, who here thinks the U.S. is going to withdraw from the Paris Agreement? Okay, I'm going to give you my take on it, unless it already happened. Um, you know, uh, you never know with this president how quickly news is created. So first, let's just start, what is happening in the U.S. when it comes to CO2? Right, so this just tells you CO2 emissions um, over the past, you know, 30, 40 years. Uh, last, uh, if you look at 2016, versus 2005 levels, you may recall that the U.S. has baseline is 2005. I think CO2 has gone down around 15 or 16 percent relative to 2005 levels. I think the uh, greenhouse gas emissions may be about 11 percent below 2005 levels. So some significant progress made, much of that market driven, some of that policy driven, right? Um, but, but uh, oh, and here is kind of actually, if you go to the next, um, you know, we're beginning to see this taking place, this decoupling of greenhouse gas emissions and growth in a number of economies around the world. I think the Netherlands has gone down about 8% in CO2, while its GDP increased 15%. But that, you know, compares to, you know, the UK that's gone down 20% or, you know, or, uh, or Germany that's gone down 12% with slightly larger growth. But this issue of decoupling is still taking place in many countries um, around the world, which is a very encouraging sign. Um, but uh, President Trump has come into office and he's done a lot of things that work against the climate agenda. This is just, you don't have to go through this by any means, but just a number of the actions that he has taken, which is largely about completely dismantling President Obama's climate action plan. Although he has put in place many of these things, cutting EPA funding, muzzling climate science, um, gutting the clean power plan, reducing other types of environmental regulations, climate regulations that Obama has put in place, it isn't that straightforward, right? Many of these things require budget to do, and budget ultimately is decided by our Congress, not by the administration. Um, there are uh, many things that will be challenged in court as well. So you're going to see, and, and, and also you're going to see a lot more action pivot kind of to the states and cities. So, so even though he has put in place many of these things, it's not a foregone conclusion that they will all come to, come to bear. But if they did, this is what would happen. The green line is where uh, the United States would have been with its CO2 plans um, or its CO2 emissions under the Obama Climate Action Plan. The blue line is based on some 
excellent analytical work that one of our colleague organizations, Rodian, put together and said, if all of what Trump has put in place actually comes to fruition, what would happen if nothing else changed, right? So you begin to see a fairly significant gap here um, between what the United States committed in terms of its climate commitment and what will actually take place. But one thing that it doesn't fully take into account is where we are continue to see significant leadership taking place in the United States, either at the subnational level, with the private sector, and even potentially with federal policy. So you have states and cities that are doing some quite exciting things, uh, renewable energy standards, uh, carbon pricing, uh, other types of greenhouse gas emission reduction targets, cities, 10 big cities have already made 100% renewable energy uh, commitments. So you're beginning to see significant subnational action. On the private sector, you have 1,000 U.S. companies that have signed a pledge that the United States should back the Paris Climate Agreement because it makes good economic sense. 240 of the Fortune 500 U.S. companies have taken greenhouse gas or renewable energy or energy efficiency targets or some combination of that. And even on the federal side, whether it is around tax reform, whether it is around trade reform, or its big infrastructure bill, you could actually see conversations starting to take place, as unlikely as it may seem today, for some type of carbon pricing proposal to emerge uh, in the next few years in the United States. It's also quite important to remember that projections are projections, and this is a complex science. Uh, the AEO is a report that the U.S. Energy uh, Agency puts out each year. And here is what they've projected emissions to be in the previous reports. And what you see again is that oftentimes the actual emissions have exceeded the projections because to some extent the projections fail to capture how dynamic uh, energy markets are uh, in the United States and what that means in terms of overall emission reductions. So, will Trump withdraw from the Paris Agreement? Uh, you all may recognize this picture from the G7 just a few days ago. Uh, there was a very big, so you all probably know, and I know it's been covered in the papers quite a big, two camps within the White House, you know, one for, one against. You got, you know, Ivanka, Trump, and Jared, and, and Tillerson kind of arguing. I mean, the head of Exxon is your strongest ally for staying in the Paris Climate Agreement uh, on one side. And then you got, you know, Scott Pruitt and, you know, Steve Bannon and some other, some other figures um, that are arguing um, that, you know, he should withdraw. There was a big play made that there would be some type of agreement in the G7 communique that would enable Trump to stay in. The fact that that did not take place has us more concerned. Um, so I think the balance of the kind of the kind of general prevailing view is despite terrific outreach from Republicans, from the private sector, from states and cities, that in this case um, it is quite plausible Trump will withdraw the United States from the climate agreement, from the Paris Agreement, not the UNFCCC, from the Paris Agreement. But as you know, there's a three-year withdrawal process, and I suspect that this conversation will not die just with the announcement that we are expecting later this week. Um, last slide. Um, and and, and the, thing, the thing that is so silly about this entire debate is that there is so much that climate action is doing that benefits the U.S. economy. Um, there are three million jobs, uh, I'm sorry, there are, um, I think, I think, uh, I don't, I, there is orders of multiple, you know, multiple jobs in solar compared to coal in the United States. There are significant gains to be made in terms of energy security, in terms of other important externalities. But still the debate, you know, continues in no small part because we continue to have this debate about the economics of climate action and more, more, more honestly really about winners and losers and vested political interests and how we actually can overcome those types of political and institutional challenges that prevent us. So even though the economics, I think, are increasingly working in our favor, uh, the, you know, the challenge, the fight, is still only half over. We need to understand the politics 
that go into many of these decisions as well. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I hope you found that uh, interesting, and I look forward to the uh, discussion that takes place later. Thank you very much. I'm getting the advice to find a place where this still works. So, down here? Is it working? Okay. So, um, thank you very much for a very stimulating uh, lecture. A positive one. Well, in the end, it has a bit of a cliffhanger, one could say. Uh, we'll wait and see. But, but in general, the story is a positive story, yes. It, 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 it's, it's about opportunities related to sustainable development climate change. But then back to my original question, you know, how to turn a discourse of burden into a discourse of opportunity. If the opportunity is so self-evident, then why are we still having these cliffhangers? Yeah. So that could be a part of the I, oh, okay, so, good? Yeah? <laughs> it's magic. <laughs> no, but I start not with a cliffhanger. I was last week at California because we as an agency are also working together with California with Jerry Brown and his uh, colleagues who are preparing what I like, the Bill 100 for 100% 100 in 2045. And that's the answer of California on, on that what is happening in, in, in Washington. And I think that's the right answer. It's the right answer of the cities there and other...
still not working. <laughs> so let's, let's see if we can fix that, that by the end of the, this session. Um, one, one thing I, I picked up from your contribution, and perhaps we should take that into the discussion, is the position of losers. Uh, and perhaps we don't do enough about the losers. Perhaps we, we just focus too much on the front side of the developments and lose, lose a side on what's happening in the back side of that transformation. Because, because you can talk about the coal industry, you can talk about the fossil fuel industry, you can talk about farming. It's also happening in, in the farming sector. And the large, large groups are organizing themselves uh, against the transformation because they have the inevitable assessment that they are losing on the losing side of that transformation. So what to do with them? So, so that, that's a point which I would like to take into the discussion, but obviously there are other points too. Um, I would like to invite uh, Doreen Putman from ASN Bank, uh, Manager Institutional Relationships. Sorry about this. Is it better? Can you hear me now? It must work now, and it does. <laughs> Thank you for your interesting uh, speech and uh, yours as well. I'm from the ASN Bank, and I certainly want to give you some perspective from a banker's uh, point of view. You m this is not really working well, so I will put it here. Um, you might know that the ASN Bank started... Oh, my ear bell. They can come off. <laughs> ASN Bank uh, started an uh, international initiative, um, PCAF, that's the platform for carbon accounting amongst financials. So it means that we bankers, we will tell you how much CO2 our projects in which we invested and where your money went uh, really has uh, 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 <laughs> realized. And, of course, we had to make a promise. So what we said, without knowing how to get there, in 2030, none of the euros that you have entrusted to us will lead to any more production of CO2. We didn't know how to do that. Nobody knew. And we invited all the other bankers and pension funds, institutional financials, to join us in thinking about it, how are we going to measure it, that's the first thing, and then how to develop strategies to reduce it. And we started another platform, that is the platform PEEF, it is the platform for energy efficiency and financials. The second platform also includes the building uh, construction sector, the installation sector, and all the other stakeholders in the renovation of the already build the uh, estate. So private houses and office buildings and all the um, real estate. Now, we can't, we bankers, we can't get the buildings that we invest into CO2 neutrality and energy neutrality if others will not join us. And the government, of course, is one of the important players. What has the Dutch government done so far? Uh, anyhow, it has uh, um, installed an act, which is called the uh, Environmental um, Act. And um, this act states that every company that uses up to more than 50,000 kilowatt hours a year is uh, forced to do all the investments that that company can get back, paid back, in five years' time to reduce the energy. And uh, up to, I think, two years ago, the amount of um, P 
people paid by the government to see to it that they, this law was really followed up was zero. So if nobody checks out, then a law will not work. But nowadays, we have seen that there's more interest in it, and I think that this um, law has been taken more seriously. That will help us. We have also seen that all buildings larger than 100 square meters uh, are in 2023 no longer for rent, can no longer be sold if they don't have a label that is be from C and upwards. So all the bad office buildings will be useless if the owners will not start to renovate it in time. This is a very good sign. Um, but the government has not yet designed the law that even the Dutch companies, um, the enterprises, have asked for a climate law. Climate law is also really an important thing. The government has provided grants, subsidies and funds um, in which also Rabobank and ASN Bank have joined to renovate the uh, real estate. But as we all know, we are not yet very far. May I ask you, who is living in a house with the A label or above? Who? That is really a minority, you see. And it is in your own benefit to do so, they say. But still you haven't. Now, who thinks that it is a lot of hassle to do so? Ha! Now we get a majority. So, that's the whole point. It is just a lot of hassle. And uh, our brain may know that we should do it. But we don't, because there are always other things to do. But we can find a way out. And... Um, you know, even the construction side and, and all the people working in the installation sector, they don't have knowledge and hands enough to get to that massive rate of it that we need for all the buildings that we have. Um, I will tell you one positive thing, because that's always good to do so. Uh, in uh, Deventer, a uh, city you probably all know, we are doing an experiment. I am also the manager of the... Uh, over Rijssel Energy Fund, a fund from the uh, provincial government. And um, that uh, fund has decided, together with ASN uh, Green Project Fund, to finance an experiment in which the construction and installation sector, united in what we call the warning abonnement, offers the public to renovate their houses without them letting even think about what has to be done. The only thing that they get is a bill, and uh, the bill per month is uh, hopefully not larger than the reduction in the energy cost that they would have otherwise in that particular month. Now, um, I can tell you this has been a long, long road, and we have even had many questions of suspicious um, people in the Ministry of Finance, uh, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Ministry of uh, Internal Affairs, whether it would be really in the benefit of the inhabitants of the houses that we would offer them such a scheme. And uh, yes, we hope that it is. But it is an experiment and we are on the, on the, on the right way, I think. The other responsibilities that we banks have to pick up is to look at uh, financing renewable energy. And I was triggered by your um, remark that the banks will say it is too costly. Well, you know, costly is very uh, relative. Because if I say that I need to get my money back in five years' time, then in during these five years, it is very costly. Because if I say that I want to have my money back in 30 years' time, it suddenly is not that costly, right? When we had in the Netherlands a discussion of financing wind parks offshore, we had a discussion of who would finance the grid. Now, if a state or company would do so, they could take 75 years to write off the investment. But if we banks would in invest in a private company that would manage the grid, 
Well, 30 years would already be far beyond what we were happy to look at. It is not more costly. That is nonsense. But it depends on the way you look at it, the systems that you have, right? So uh, now if we look at renewable energy, often it is the, the time frame that we have to look at with new eyes. And here comes also a need to combine forces between banks and pension funds. Because pension funds, they don't want any repayment. So in terms of a monthly cash flow, there are no expenditures, right? Because the pension funds, they want to have forever their money invested and get a proper dividend. But we banks, we can't offer you forever the money because we have to roll over the money and it has to come back. So the monthly payments to us include interest plus repayment. If we learn how to join forces, then we can do wonderful things in financing these wind parks or whatever local uh, energy uh, production projects. We have a government that has uh, helped us and that has also been very contraproductive, if I may say so. Uh, subsidies for photovoltaic panels for private people is just very bad. I have installed them on my own house. I have refused to ask the subsidy out of principle because, you know, this helps an economy to go up by heaps and then fall down and everybody is sitting on his hands and waiting for the new load of subsidy to come. And we have seen a bankruptcy amongst uh, companies. This is not a good instrument. Another good instrument is, for instance, green financing funds giving a tax facility. But then again, the government in the last 10 years went up and down with ideas of shall we maintain it or not. Well, you know what happens when people start to doubt if they will have some benefit from a fund, mm, then it stops growing. So it's good that we have good ideas and that the government tries to do things, but they all really should do the things that will last. Continuity to speak with you is crucial. And... Um, we hope they will really focus on continuity, like the Postcode Roos project. It is extremely difficult, but now that people finally start to understand it, now we must continue and not say it hasn't grown so fast in the last years, we'll stop it. No, now we have to wait for the real uh, expenditure. Third, that's my last uh, point that we bankers can play a role in, is in protecting the soil and protecting biodiversity. Because what we see is that the resources that nature provides us are getting lost because we don't price it properly. And um, at the very moment, there are banks thinking of other ways of financing farming that includes protecting the natural resources and the biodiversity. Well, you all know a farmer has either to pay a um, kind of mortgage to the bank, so that's interest, or he can get the land in uh, for, well, say, short-term or longer-term uh, lease contracts. And the very short-term ones are cheap. But if you would be a farmer and you would know I get the land for one year and next year it can't be mine probably, would you invest in biodiversity? Well, you wouldn't, right? So only if you have long-term contracts, you would do so. And a long-term contract is much more expensive than a short-term one. And we all know that the farmers are up to here with debt. And they are not the angry farmers that don't want to protect biodiversity, but they are kind of, you know, hopeless. And they don't know how to do it. Now, we bankers, we are thinking of asking our clients to withdraw their money from the banks. Yes, I am uh, representing a saving bank, but it would be very good if many money would be withdrawn and used to buy land, and the dividend on that land would not be a high percentage, a percentage in, in interest or dividend or whatsoever, but the joy of having protected the very soil that is our common future. And also maybe some events or, you know, like um, um, payment in barter from the farms that we will have helped to uh, um, restructure 
uh, the soil that they are toiling. And in this way, we need one thing from the government, because we know that the government is now selling a lot of land that they have bought previously, and they look at one thing, and that is euros. And they don't have any other critical criteria to protect also biodiversity. And what we want is that they will instruct their own people to have a broader look and not only to look at cash. You might expect banks to do that. But you shouldn't expect the government to do that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this microphone. Hopefully it keeps on working. Um, Marlix Koopman from VNO NCOH. Um, I, I, because I know you have to run away quickly, uh, uh, perhaps you can give a brief feedback on what you've heard so far. VNO NCOH is very much in favor of, of uh, more proactive sustainability action. Yes, we are. Uh, uh, and, then still th and then still the question is on the table, so why doesn't this turn our overall debate in the Netherlands into a debate of opportunity? So reflect a bit on that. Perhaps I w because I would like to make the turn in the discussion about why are we, why, why, why are we sticking to this, this debate on costs and, and, and why are we sticking on the debate of, you know, we, we, should, we should not do this too fast, et cetera, et cetera. Why can't we make the turn to debate on opportunities? What's keeping us? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, I enjoy that you uh, want to do this a little bit more faster. The reason I'm here is because we've released this program for the new government, which is called NL Next Level, in which we are giving a, a kind of master plan for a prosperous, uh, sustainable, and also inclusive uh, country. We are from the Confederation of Industry and Employers. For your Thank you for your uh, nice story. I've uh, already uh, read about the uh, World Economy uh, Outlook. You were in our tower, the maximum prime minister, or oh, ex-prime minister was there. So we really like that story. And um, uh, what's keeping us? Because that's the question. Well, first, I heard it from Doreen, thank you very much, and from our German guest, we need a continuity of policy. Government has to give business and financial business a uh, perspective of several decades. This is the uh, way we're leading. If you're gonna put your money in this kind of targets, there we wanna go. Uh, this is the market we are releasing uh, in favor, we are in favor of European market, which will have 500 million customers. Then you will have a business case to start, invest in, um, uh, to start investing and to get your cost down, to drive the cost down. Because at this moment, uh, transport was uh, uh, named. Um, if you want to sustain transport, there is this very few people which can afford a new car, just a new car. There are even less people which can afford an electric car. There are a few people who can afford to live sustainable. At this point in time, most people cannot. For housing, it's a little bit different. More people can uh, afford to li li have a, uh, a, a sustainable house, but there are opportunity costs. Will I go to ho on a holiday? Or will I uh, start having a living in a sustainable house? Will I buy a bigger house and have all my mortgage space into uh, having the funds for that bigger house? Or do I have a smaller house and sustain it? Those are opportunity costs. And at this moment in time, we see people preferring a nice new kitchen or bathroom above um, going off gas when you want to heat your, uh, your house. So there is no real uh, perspective for people to really want it. And it costs a lot of money or hassle, or you have to uh, loan it for the next 30 years, which you already did when you bought the house in the first place. So it's not that easy. Government has to help. So we've got plans for that. Of course, we've got plans. Um, government needs to set aside the uh, uh, billions of money we see coming because the economy is coming up again, set it aside to invest. It's really easy to spend your money on care, on social welfare, and so forth. That's really easy, and it will give you a lot of uh, 
pleased voters. But at this point in time, it's necessary to try to keep the, uh, the um, available amounts of money we've got for care and social welfare, well, keep them steady. To keep them uh, 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 down is, is very hard. I'm aware of that, but keep them steady. And let the amount of money we are well, getting from a rising economy in investments. And investments, so there are two kinds. First, the investment uh, a government has to do itself. Like, um, we've got this big project, Marker Wadden. You should, uh, it's, it's in, uh, next to Amsterdam, in this lake called Marker Meer, it's dead. And uh, Natuur Monument, are they in the room? Nobody here? Well, Natuur Monument is building these islands to give, get fishes uh, back in those and, and get birds back. This is government, government money. There is no business here available. But then you've got the housing story, and I'll tell it in Utopia too. Housing is a business, but we have to uh, have some government banking, some government grants on the side to let uh, pension funds, to let banks uh, give uh, an opportunity to give people uh, chances to, to really uh, start investing in their own prosper uh, prosperity, in their own houses. And uh, that will happen with the offices in the first place, Doreen told us, 2023, uh, I believe. Um, well, still we've got massive uh, 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 offices not rented as yet. So it will be not that easy as you just pictured it, because uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, owners do not have income from those uh, offices as yet. Those are problems we have to uh, to fix, and government can help us. But first, let them give this uh, perspective of the co of upcoming decades and uh, build a, a system with a law or a, or a board, or I don't really care how they do it, to uh, sustain that the next cabinet will continue the same pace. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So you get. Well, one of the figures you mentioned was um, R&D going down, yes? Did I see that correctly? So, so what about that? I mean, okay, so, so government can give a system in which they can deliver continuity. And I agree, because that, that's a big issue also in the Netherlands. We've lost out of wind energy because we, we failed to, in a certain sense, give the continuity to the business which was needed at the beginning. We sold it to Denmark. Yeah, and we defend defend your early winners. Yeah, defend your early winners because don't push them too early in the, the, the sort of strong winds of the markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that's that's all there. So that that's the responsibility you could say of the public sector. But I think what what we are arguing for here is is a much more collaboration or adaptive collaboration between the public and the private sector in sort of searching through the system preconditions we need for this opportunity side to come up. Yeah. So we, we need not a, 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 a sort of dichotomy between the public and the private sector. We, look, we have to look for collaborations between. But then, you know, there is always the feeling that the employer's side is always looking for the government for the good side of the story. The bad side of the story obviously, is, is your own R&D investments. Yeah. And then there is the question, where does, does the sort of the, 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 the private sector, where is the private sector's R&D investment going at the moment? How is it in a certain sense linking in to this discussion? Oh, I don't know them all, to be... Uh, no, but, but in terms of in general policy making. In general policy making. Um, well, what you see is that uh, private uh, investment is in R&D is like going steady, but is not uh, like the NAT lab. And those kinds of investment, those kinds of, 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 of uh, R&D is, is going lost. I have to be quite uh, uh, honest with that. It's really way more on getting things to market. If, it, if your uh, uh, time to market is above seven years, approximately, you're gonna have a hard case in your uh, company to get, it, to get your uh, uh, investigation pro project uh, to, get, uh, to get it going. And at the same time, we see in Dutch uh, government, we see, uh, uh, especially since uh, 2011, the expenditures on R&D public expenditures are going down, down, down. I just read from uh, Wageningen University, uh, we've got this uh, big uh, top sector in the Netherlands to uh, 
I'm not that. Um, yeah, I have to go. Um, and and uh, they had about a hundred uh, uh, people uh, uh, working on, on flowers. And I just uh, read they've got eight left. Flowers is a big thing in, in, in the Netherlands. We are very bad at the moment to, uh, in, in, in making sure that we still have a good living, that we still can uh, have, have good uh, products in 20 years to come. I'm, I'm really concerned about that, both from the public and the private side. And we have to be, uh, uh, we, I work for the Confederation of Industries. They pay me to go to the, uh, to the uh, public sector and make them aware of our interests. And they, pay, they don't pay me to come to get uh, to them. Well, you have to spend more in your R&D. Why aren't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> that, that? That's a very hard uh, place for me to be. But I, I do, do uh, see the same as you do. And um, it worries me. Explore that further. Um, could, could I um, ask uh, Foppe de Haan uh, from the Ministry of Economic Affairs uh, to reflect a bit on this discussion? Because again, we're, we're searching still. We're searching for uh, the shift from from a discourse of burden to a discourse of opportunity. If there are so many opportunities, because you, you've sketched a landscape of really sort of you know, a positive future. Yeah? Healthy cities, uh, 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 retrofitters buildings, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Good landscapes, good agriculture. So there are lots of opportunities. But the, the question really is, how can we make the institutional shift yeah, from from this burden side to this opportunity side? And from the from the perspective of the Ministry of Economic Affairs, how can you how do you see this discussion? And what would it, would we need from the new cabinet, for instance, to make this shift in the Netherlands also happening? Because, because, again, let me give you one example. Because, because Wind Park on the North Sea yeah, is a big success story. Uh, uh, we, ha we have all the things there in place. Continuity. Uh, we have a government that took place uh, took, took care of the long-term investment to get the grid ready. So the companies were able to invest in what they were good at, etc., etc. So that was a very big project. A project of a scale which would enable us to take the opportunity. Where do we see next kind of that scale projects in the Netherlands? So first of all, I would like to thank uh, Manish for his uh, beautiful introduction. I think uh, he quite uh, rightly uh, mentioned that we are living in a very interesting time. Uh, we are rethinking globalization. We are rethinking uh, the role of governments and their cooperation with societies. We are rethinking capitalism, growth, goal setting. So these are things are, that are going on. And in that perspective, I would like to mention five, uh, what I would call system uh, responsibilities for the national government. Of course, we have the government at several scale levels. We have the local governments, we have the national government, and we have in Europe, the European governments. But at the national uh, level, we have five system uh, responsibilities in this energy and climate transition. First of all, of course, there is the, the political responsibility, the democracy, political democracy. Secondly, there is the responsibility for the international cooperation, the Paris Agreement, the European Union. Thirdly, there is the cooperation, there is the role, the system responsibility, to ensure that governments work closer together. So the national government, complementary to the European government, complementary to the local government, in a transition where, in my view, local governments will get more and more involvement and importance in the energy and climate transition. And the fifth responsibility, the fifth system responsibility, is the role of national governments for participation. Participation of science in the debate, in the transition. Participation of industry, small and medium industry, but also bigger industries. And participation of local communities, citizens. So what can you expect? Well, first of all, now, first of all, a uh, remark um, on the past few years. 
I think the Dutch government, the go Dutch government, have done a great job, have done a great job in stepping in into the energy agreement. We have since 2013 in the Netherlands a national energy agreement, which also contributes to the climate goals. And if the predictions, the realizations, and the predictions made by this organization, PBL, uh, are right, then we are on track for the 2020, 2023 goals. If the predictions are right, and if all the 47 parties, uh, the expect, <laughs> it's a model, it's a model ex expectation. It's a model expectation. So if all the 47 parties who signed up with the energy agreement do their job, then we are on track for 2020, 2023. Then what, may, what can you expect the, the upcoming months? In the European Union, we are uh, working on what we call the winter package. These are legislative proposals made by the European Commission. All governments have uh, set and are committed that at the end of this year, beginning of next year, all governments will present to each other and to the European Commission their national energy and climate plan for 2030. So we have the energy agreement, which is up to 2020, 23. All governments are now working on the 2030 in the perspective of 2050. 2% or 1.5%, that's something we, I think, at the moment, most of them are working on 2%, but next year we will have an assessment of the European Commission whether or not we have to increase our ambitions. Yeah. What can you expect then of this transition you were talking about, uh, Hans, uh, the, the burden or the, the profits? I would say there is a change, there is a mind shift, a change in the mindset in, in the governments. We speak a lot about CO2 reduction, but we have seen that green jobs are coming up. I see in the Ministry of Economic Affairs at the moment that a lot of people are working on a new approach for innovation, a new approach for innovation, more mission-driven innovation. I hope, I think that the new government will also add something to this R&D budget you mentioned. In, indeed, there is a responsibility for industry. Part of the budget has to come, the biggest part has to come from industry, but also there is a big part of that budget that has to come from the government, the national government. And I see a tendency, I've seen proposals, uh, that uh, well, we may expect something to happen there. I don't know if we can bent the trend uh, uh, as far as these R&D expenditures are concerned, but I think there is something going on. And uh, there are some people in, in the room. A few years ago, so when I started my work on energy, modern industry policy was a taboo word. It was not allowed to speak about modern industry policy. What is modern industry policy? Modern industry policy is that you, you see a lot of resistances against a transition. You see a, a lot of interests who are against transitions. But on the other hand, you see a lot of innovators and people who, who are supporting a transition. And what we said in the ministry, it was eight or nine years ago, is that we have to introduce a new policy approach, modern industry policy. In the Green Growth Letter, I participated in the project on writing the first policy Green Growth Letter, was sent to Parliament in 2013. This new approach was introduced. At that time, ministers started talking about modern industry policy. And I think this is the opportunity we have to seize end of the year, I hope, also in the framework of a new national energy agreement, you may expect the integrated national energy and climate uh, report of the Netherlands and of all the other, and we will see some step ahead 
it will go slowly, but it will be it will be another step ahead in hopefully achieving the objectives we have uh, together. Good. Thank you. All right, we have uh, still 10, 15 minutes to go. So I'm looking at the audience. Surely there are questions or remarks or discussions you want to raise. Yes, I'll come to you and with this new type of microphone, which is sort of very interactive. Um, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Ronnie Takens, Takens. I work at the National Audit Office, so the Algemene Rekenkamer. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit confused after uh, some of all these presentations because um, I hear a lot also about uh, goals, sustainable development goals. It's very easy to set all these goals, but to, uh, to um, I cannot foresee a future which has, in 2050, 100% renewable energy um, in the Netherlands or anywhere in the world. It's so easy to say, and it's... It's totally different to the question about 25% renewable energy um, with coal, with maybe backup from coal plants, backup from gas plants. And now we're just talking about um, why are we not looking at the opportunities? But I think nobody's also telling us, also not PBL, what are the costs of that kind of future that we are seeing? And I think there's a lot of uh, almost opportunistic positivism like we can use this the technology is there but yeah what are the costs what is the two 2050 and 2100 future look like without any fossil fuels i mean that's a totally different question than what we are talking about a lot today i think it concerns me a little bit yeah. Yeah. so, so, so you, you're asking in a certain sense for a, a more uh, uh, balanced cost benefit analysis which is also taking into account the real costs of this transition. But that would also then include, say, for instance, paying attention to the real costs of no action, of inaction. Because that then also has to be taken into account, because, because we want to make the real estimate then to say, and, and, and we have to, have to have the real balance then and the real figures into the house. Somebody wants to respond on this? Yes? That's a discussion which is running in Germany since 30 years. And um, yeah, it's true. Uh, and uh, we have made a lot of scenario studies for these 100% renewable. And uh, to be honest, it, it changed. If you would have taken scenario studies 20 years ago, the costs have been of 100% renewable and greenhouse gas neutral Germany were higher than today, clearly. Why? The prices of renewables has dropped so dramatically that uh, even people like me, which always were claimed to be too optimistic, had uh, the wrong numbers. So that's one part of the story. So if you invest money in technologies, the, the price of technologies get, go down. Even that for storage system. We in Germany are going not only for, we don't want to have coal, how do we solve it? One probably solution is taking power to gas, into the gas system, taking power to heat, power, taking power to anything, whatever. You can have 700 pages of study about that. And if you calculate all that, then and you take the most, uh, the worst calculation, then the kilowatt hour in the year 2050 is twice as high as today. So for a household which at that time has also efficient technologies, the price is more or less the same. For industry, they have to adapt, clearly. So that's cl But it, if it happens in all Europe, it is not a competitive problem because it happens in all Europe. So it's only if one region gets the prices up and the other is not, you have a problem for industry or for car makers or something like that. At the end of the day, um, it is, let's say, the worst case, but if you compare it with uh, adaption, with climate costs and all these things, that's the much cheapest way. Stern report, all reports show that it is the cheapest way. And trust me, you, we, have, we have calculated, you know Germans are crazy with models and calculations, and we have calculated several varianten of, of these 100% in greenhouse gas. It works. So you don't don't have, a f there are a lot of people running around, so good on Dunkelflaute, it's a new word, you know? Dunkelflaute means that you don't have wind and you don't have, 
it's night, okay? Especially January. Dunkelflaut in January. It's a new buzzword going against this movement. There are technologies for that, but we have to implement them year for year. And then it was possible. Um, 20 years ago, energy industry said, if you have more than 5% of volatile uh, electricity in the grid, the grid will fail. So we have more than 30% in Germany, and we have the most secure grid of Europe at the moment. So don't trust the losers. <laughs> I'm looking around <coughs> for remarks, questions, yes? Okay, good, yeah. <laughs> the, um, no, no, it's, it, it, and to some extent, it's, it's not dissimilar from the question um, that, that, and I think the real, um, the, the, the real challenge here a little bit is uh, the, dis the distinction between the power sector and the transport sector. So I think in the power sector, I think the argument you made was exactly spot on, that, that if, you look, if you look at the economic cost benefit of flexible variable renewables, right? So not only just the cost of solar and wind, but the cost of battery storage. The dramatic cost declines we've seen on the power sector have, been, have, have truly changed the economics. Storage will be there in about 10 or 15 years where you can have an all-in cost that'll be much more competitive than coal. The problem then is a set of other issues that I want to come back to, which is when we still have a good economic story, why aren't we getting traction as fast as we want to, and there's reasons for that that I think we need to focus on. I think on the transport side, it's a little bit more complicated because I don't think at the moment we have yet electrified transport as fast as we need to. So I think as the power sector begins to electrify, um, I think we need to shift from oil and gas as quickly as we can. And so the, the argument that I would make, A, is that, look, if we're serious about a two-degree world, one and a half degree world, even a two degree world, uh, the costs of inaction, as Hans was saying, are going to be so significant. Nigeria is a very vulnerable country. It is not in your self interest for a three or four degree world. Um, so we, we kind of, writ large, we know we need to move forward uh, with, with a much more, the world needs to move forward on a faster decarbonization path. Then the question is um, how quickly can we pivot away from oil and gas? And you may recall that. Um, that image that I showed you that showed the reserves of oil and gas today far exceed what carbon budget we have. So from the Nigerian government perspective, there's no need to invest further in R&D on oil and gas because already what's been proven far exceeds what we can burn, the carbon bubble argument. Then the question is how quickly can we move towards uh, electrifying transport? particularly for light-duty vehicles, for cars, passenger cars, light trucks. And I think that's something that we're going to see in the next 10 or 15 years. So why would you make significant oil investments, which would typically require 20, 30, 40-year paybacks today, if you know in 10 or 15 years you're going to start shifting away from it? So I would make the argument that no more further R&D or significant investment in new oil and gas. Recognize what we have today is what you need as a transition in the next 15 years to electrified 